here's a question for you. Are you the UK's next astronaut? Now could be your chance, because for the first time in more than a decade, the European Space Agency has launched a recruitment drive for astronaut cadets. The SA, as we call it, yeah. you know, we, we just go for the letters. Yeah. Uh, and astronaut Rated Tim Peake is strongly encouraging people from all walks of life to apply as they seek to expand diversity among their ranks. Very exciting, because Major Peake joins us now. I mean, everybody has been so enthralled by your adventures, so enthralled by what you've done, that actually you yourself are a great advert for doing this. Everybody would want to come along and do it. But we do think of you as a sort of slightly superhuman, somebody that's above us all. But you're here to tell us that maybe all of us could reach for the stars. Well, yeah, this is really exciting because the European Space Agency doesn't have selection processes that often. And so this is an opportunity for, for people who have dreamt of becoming an astronaut, who want to push the boundaries to give it a go. Uh, you do have to have certain qualifications, of course, that ESA are looking for. But um, well, I really would encourage anybody who's got those qualifications to give it a shot. Yeah, ESA, Kate, by the way, not ESA. I know. ESA. You see, that would, learning how to say the organisation you're applying to would be probably major, one of the list of So, Major Tim, I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things, as Kate said, we've all been enthralled by your mm. adventure and what we've seen you do. But there will be young girls particularly, because Laura's saying that they are looking for women as well. They want women to apply. There'll be young girls who are sitting here thinking this morning, what do I need to do to try and get into space? What are the qualifications I need? What's the process? Why is this now more accessible than it's ever been? Yes, yeah, so we're really trying to open this up that you do need to have a master's degree and we're looking for a master's in things like medicine or engineering, natural sciences, computer science. So STEM based background um, is what's required. And then a postgraduate three years worth of professional experience. So although there's not a minimum age limit, you can obviously tell that if you need those requirements, then you're probably going to be in your late 20s, um, early 30s. Um, and then the, the maximum age limit is 50. So we're looking for people within those kind of age brackets with those qualifications to apply. Although it's great for youngsters as well because they can see what sort of things might lead them Pathway, to it. We've yeah. got some hopeful recruits who sent us in some questions. We've got this first video from 14-year-old Oscar. Maybe you could answer this. I have ADHD and hearing loss and I was wondering whether I can become an astronaut. So ADHD and hearing loss, uh, mm. but Oscar's still interested whether he could still become an astronaut. Yes, well, ESA are looking from a medical point of view to have what's called a class two medical. That's the same medical that you would need if you wanted to be a private pilot. Um, so as long as you can get a class two medical, you can go through the application process and then ESA will decide on a case by case uh, basis. And normally with hearing, we ask for about 25 decibels of hearing because that below that is just not a safe environment. You wouldn't be able to hear any warnings for, for um, any emergencies that might occur on the space station. Yeah, that would be important. Uh, we've got this question from 13-year-old Scarlett. This one's about education. Hi, Tim. It's Scarlett here. My question to you is, what would you need to study to become an astronaut? Right, so key things they can study, Tim. Yeah, it's a great question from Scarlett. Um, I would say, you know, I really encourage people to study STEM. STEM is going to be so relevant in your life, whatever career you choose, because technology is advancing so much. But um, studying a STEM subject is important. Uh, if you haven't done that, it's never too late. I didn't get my degree till I was 33. OK, STEM, just asking for a friend. Uh, what does it mean? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So those kind of subjects. You're so rude. I did know that. I just thought not everybody did. <laughs> I was asking for me. I've, I've, we, I've, been doing options. Arts, I've been doing options for kids. I know all about STEM. 13-year-old uh, Hire has a really good question. My name is Hyatt and I'm wondering if people who wear glasses can still go into space. Thank you. That's a good question. I, uh, my, my cousin felt that he couldn't become a, a pilot because he had an eyesight problem. Now I think you can and you'd think if you were worried about your eyesight it would be even more important in space. How does it work out? Yeah, that's a great question from Hyatt. Yes, you can is the answer. Um, we need you to have 20-20 vision with glasses or contact lenses. So as long as it's correctable to 20-20, that's fine. OK, and uh, lastly, we've got a question from 15-year-old George for you. Hi, Tim. I'm George. What height do you need to be to be an astronaut? Can you be too tall or too small? Oh, good question, this. Is it the like physical... ballet dancers yeah. where sometimes too tall is it good? physical size, because, of course... There's not a lot of room in the space station with everybody else up there and all the equipment. 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, when I was selected, ESA were asking for astronauts who were between about five foot and six foot three. And that's because we were flying in the Soyuz. And so there's a, a height limit you simply can't physically fit. Uh, we now have two different other spacecraft, SpaceX and Boeing, which will be launching soon, which has expanded the height envelope. So ESA haven't actually specified uh, a maximum height limit on this selection. So there's a lot more scope. And of course, you were taller, weren't you, Tim, when you came back down to Earth than when you went up? It's true, yeah, you, your spine elongates because without gravity, uh, it's not compressed every day. So I grew about an inch and a half to two inches in space. How extraordinary. It even makes you go taller. This may Listen, be my chance, we have Kate. one more recruit. This, this is your moment. <laughs> to finally Let's get those extra inches. Let's propel you into space and see how you get on. Uh, we've got another recruit as well. Her name's Laura Tobin. You might be familiar with her. <laughs> I do. She's got so keen. <laughs> She's so keen, Tim. Uh, we've had a look at her CV. We're, I'll run through it and then you you can comment as well. So, is she a citizen of a European Space Agency member or associate member state? Yes. yes. Uh, does she have three years relevant professional postgrad experience? Yes. Is Laura fluent in English? I think broadly yes. Yes. <laughs> broadly yes. Uh, does she have strong motivation ability to cope with the regular working hours, frequent travel and log absences from home, family and social life? Yeah. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> is she flexible with regards to places of work? Oh yes. Uh, the question is, is she calm under pressure? This is a demand. Yeah. Well, they say yes on the, on the sheet there. <laughs> but the question is, do we actually believe she's calm under pressure? Yeah. Well, she's not always, is she, Ben? Should we have a little look? Got a little bit of evidence to the contrary, maybe. It is wet first thing this morning. Round there, pipe down. We're on the weather. <laughs> no, she's turning. She's what? No, no, Adam! Shut up! Yeah! Adam, stop it! Rain kept many of us awake overnight last night. And then we slowly see the sky is bright. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the sky's in the north. I'm so, this is so professional. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm scaling down the spinnaker. I don't know if I'm to laugh or cry. And I'm definitely not looking down. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a bounce in a minute. <laughs> oh, steady, Laura Tobin. You still weren't listening, were you? What's happening you with weather today, Laura? Was really nice. You've got Chris. <laughs> Happy birthday, Chris. There you go, Chris. Yeah. Happy birthday. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, yeah. 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 So. It's my birthday. <laughs> I want cake. Uh, <laughs> to be fair to, to Laura, Tim, uh, working here, she is under probably more <laughs> pressure than you'd have to deal with in space. What do you make of Laura as a potential astronaut? Uh, I think with that CV, Laura is incredibly well qualified and obviously has the jumper for the job as well. <laughs> Thanks Impressed for with the jumper, oh. particularly. Ha have, Laura, you might I have know... an in, Laura. You might have an in. Laura, I know, I'm pretty sure you'll have some questions, some important questions as well that you might like to ask Tim. So I just think a lot of people would like to know what the whole selection process is like. And then once you are hopefully selected as a candidate, how long is training? What do you go through? What was the hardest part of training? Yeah, so the selection process is pretty grueling. It's going to take about a year and a half to go through. And um, ESA are going to look at, firstly, your sort of what we call non-trainable skills, things like concentration and spatial awareness and memory retention. And there's a number of tests they can do. But then the bulk of the selection process is really all about personality and character, about your soft skills, teamwork and communication, how well you get on with other people. Uh, can you spend six months in a confined space under stressful conditions? Um, and then after that, once you're su successfully selected, you're going to go into a training period that will probably last about three years before your first mission, uh, learning all about how to fly a spacecraft from how to do a spacewalk. Um, what does weightlessness feel like? I mean, it's an incredibly exciting journey, but you do have to be prepared for a marathon worth of training. Wow. I mean, the only thing I think, Laura, that you haven't got at the moment is a master's degree. Could you quickly rustle that one up? And I was Googling it last night, looking Were into you? environmental <laughs> science masters. If anyone can do it, Laura can do it. Um, I, Tim, I wonder whether sort of all your experience being up there on the space station and being away from home and being away from the Earth for such a long time in any way prepared you for lockdown? It's a, it's a different challenge, but of course, there was isolation up there, being away from your mm. friends and your, the broader circle of people that you work with. 
It really does help. I mean, some of the environments we train in, we live in a cave for seven days, we live underwater for 12 days, and that's all about le learning how we deal with isolation and how we can get on better with other people in those conditions. And, and that really helps when you come into a lockdown environment. Um, and something we do on the space station is stick to a very strict schedule and routine. And I think it just helps to manage everyone's expectations. I certainly found that helped in a family environment as well during lockdown, just to make sure everybody knows what's happening and when and it also gives you the time to switch off and relax because that's really important when your place of work is the same as your place of rest yeah. you need to make sure you're yeah. eating well you're exercising and you're getting plenty of nutrition and rest did you have a mantra that we can all have in our heads for when it's all getting too much did you have something that you'd say to yourself uh, it's all about maintaining perspective and not worrying about the things you can't control. If you can control it and change it, if you can't control it, don't worry about it. Control so the controllables. So, Ben, just let it go. You can't control <laughs> me. Just let it go. There are some things, Tim, unfortunately, are beyond control, and Katie's right. She is one of them. <laughs> it's an absolute treat for us to have you on really the show is. this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing how this recruitment uh, process goes and who ends up making the grade as well. That's really, really exciting. And, uh, and if, if it's all right, we'll put you in touch with Laura so you can guide her through the <laughs> masters, because I think that might help as well. Thanks She's so filling in application forms as we speak, but so if you we can just give her any help, really it'll be good. About Mars Perseverance rover should be landing um, tomorrow and how excited are you and what are we hoping to find? Uh, really excited. I mean, it's, it's such a, an audacious landing as well. The, the same as the Curiosity rover with this kind of sky crane that's going to hover there and lower the rover onto the surface of Mars. And this one is really looking for signs of past or even maybe present microbial life on Mars. So a hugely exciting moment. Oh, it's fantastic, Tim. We'll all be looking out for that, and it's been lovely chatting to you. Anything else, Laura? There's loads. There's a really long list. <laughs> We're out of time. Are you going back? Bradbury is orbiting is you, the studio, waiting to, to talk to us. Are you going to back us? to space soon, Tim? I hope so, yes. All of my class hope to fly by, by 2024, so this new selection of astronauts will see us out, you know, be up to, to the end of the decade, which will, could mean the first Europeans on the surface of the moon as well, which is really exciting.